And in Hungary, Italy and France, we've seen attacks on migrants and roamers against all the values of the EU, yet nothing has happened. When we have expectations of principle and nothing happens, no wonder we lose face in the democratic human rights uh, aspirations of the European Union. But it's not just a question of this even, because when we work this out in practice, it gets worse, because these national governments have changed. In 1999, there were, there were 15 members of the EU. 12 were social democratic, three were right. Now, after 27, 21 are on the right or far right, and five or six are left or leftish or liberalish. There's been a massive political shift within the European Union. We have to recognise that. That influences who is appointed to be commissioners. Since the 2009 election, the right and the, and the, and the, and the more far right have had a majority of commissioners in the European Commission, and Barroso realises this. Everything critical goes through his cabinet now especially in home, that's internal controls and immigration. Every big thing that is put through by the, by the Commissioner goes by his cabinet before it can be put out to the world. But it also changes who goes and sits on the working parties of the Council of the European Union. There's, in, in Justice and Home, there are some 36 working parties. And if you're sent as an official, and there are two turns on the table, one is more repressive and one is more liberal, which one is, is going to get supported when we know the instructions have been coming from the interior ministries at home? What is going to happen? And in the European Parliament, it is a fact that if the right and far right unite, they have a majority. But if the left and liberals and greens unite, they can never have a majority. There are some contradictions and some issues. But broadly, the right can have a majority, but the left cannot in order to block legislation. What we've done, in, in effect, we've also shifted. It isn't economically. We've shifted from an era of liberal democracy, which is now long gone, in my view, towards what I call democratic authoritarianism. We live in a world where there's a shift between consent and dissent to one of manufactured consensus from the centre and marginalised dissent. We live with the old Cold War, then the war on terrorism has morphed into internal security where at first the exceptional defined the norm, and now the exceptional defines the norm. We have seen not just a shift though, this right-wing shift, we've also seen another shift, which is what I call the one-party political system. It's a monolithic one, where there is little meaningful difference between the, between the big parties at the European level. There's no principal difference. There are little differences. Elections bring marginal change. There is no really fundamental difference. And another thing we've moved, we've moved from multiculturalism to monoculturalism. A monoculture which is nurtured and funded by the EU in the name of integration. It's the imposition of white Western language, culture, traditions and histories on a people who've come from many hundreds of countries in the world. We're seeing this now built into the EU that move from multiculturalism to monoculturalism cemented by integration. And on top of all that, we've got the surveillance society, the policing state, and the security industrial complex. Now earlier, I talked about the veneer, the coating of demo democracy legitimating the drift to authoritarianism. I spoke of the effect of the one-party system in the EU, where there's little difference between two major parties. But democracy does not belong to political parties, to elections and to parliaments. Democracy is not defined as it should be. Where in fact, we are meant, so under their definition rather, in the Lisbon Treaty, it's representative government. So we work once every four or five years, and in between we're meant to keep silent or just send our letters in and whatever, send our emails in. We're not meant to get organized in, in the gap between the European elections. As I said earlier, a political democratic culture is a culture of diversity, debate, informed dissent, tolerance, respectable cultures, a healthy critical media, a sense of history, an underlying humanity, and also one which can sustain between elections in that space, can engage and actually try and influence what is being decided in our name. We need to reclaim democracy, because it does not belong to them, it belongs to us. And the responsibility of civil society and of academia, and academia is part of civil society, 
is not just to try and understand the world, but to change it. Thank you. So I think that we need to connect that together to get a, a better picture of what is happening in terms of the uh, attack on civil liberties. Sure. <coughs> I mean, just to answer that last point first, I, I did leave out of my talk because partly it was getting long and I, I, was, I was beginning to sweat quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> and one, of, one, of the, one of the things that I did leave out, and it's quite clear does happen, one of the responses, and we think of the, I, I'll expand a bit, the five, the five targets uh, since 11 September 2001. The first target was clearly terrorists and terrorist sympathisers, but that's extended now, of course, into those that actually portray this great term, radical messages. Now, these are not people who are terrorists, planning to be terrorists, who've got any evidence against them. They're not criminals, but they're people out with all of that, which is what one can call criminal, but who are purveying radical messages. And apparently th this applies to um, nationalists, um, the left and right, extreme left and right, Islamists, anti-globalization groups, etc. <laughs> and on all these groups or individuals, they're meant to collect 77 pieces of information, so-called intelligence, where are the sources. And this is all being exchanged between EU internal security forces. And I remember, and I don't think it would mind me saying this, we put this out on our website uh, early last year. <coughs> And then earlier this year, one of the political groups in the parliament said, what can we do about this proposed set of conclusions? And I had to reply, well, you can't, because those conclusions went through in April 2010. And there's an area of EU decision-making which is much underestimated. Sorry to get back to the EU. Uh, people think, because what we've got now, we've got legislation, you look at all the agenda, then we've got so non-legislative measures, and then we have council conclusions, which are what are called soft law. They're not directives, they're not regulation, but they are political legitimations. It means that if the member states and the council agree a set of conclusions like they did on radical messages, this legitimates them under soft law to cooperate together. Any, any more, two or more states can cooperate. And of course they do. And it's an area which is completely missed out of analysis of policy making, but actually it isn't just policy making, telling the commission where to go in future, it is actually used for operational purposes. So that's one aspect. Um, in, in, in terms of uh, the national, then the other threats, of course, we've got, and this is a picture across Europe, you see. That's what I, point I'm trying to get. It is terrorists. It is refugees and asylum, asylum seekers. It is migrants. It is cross-border protests and protests within countries. And I would argue the fifth uh, threat they see is all the rest of us. Because <laughs> we've got systems being, as, as I alluded to, monitoring all our travel. Man to data retention has been gone for three years now. They have got copies of all your emails, all your faxes, all your mobile phone calls, location, and they've got, and the most critically, they brought in 18 months ago, 
records of all your internet usage. Now, when they look at the, the other areas, it is the communications data, who are you talking to? But the minute you start to track a person's internet usage, you're revealing the content. You know which pages they looked at. And across most of Europe, a part of the moment United Kingdom, biometric passports are coming in, biometric ID cards are coming in too, and these are mass means of surveillance. We're going to have an EU PNR system, which was the original idea was to track everybody coming in and out of the EU and was to control visa visitors. UK, of course, was up there. No, no, it must go further than this. It must not just look at travel in and out of the EU, but all the travel within the EU as well. Now, we've seen documents which are, I mean, they're there. There's a commission survey, we'll remember state. What they want is to have a record of all travel in and out of the European Union, all travel from European member state to another European member state, and all travel in every member state by land, sea, and air. Now, that is a record. All it means is when you buy, a, when you buy your train ticket, when you buy this and that, increasingly in Britain, the old PNR number's coming up. It's being attached to your where you bought it. Increasingly, we're not, we're not paying by cash, we're paying by check, we're paying by credit card, we're paying by bar. That can all be automated and it be assigned a PNR number, passenger name record number. And that's creeping in. So in a sense, we won't even know it's happening. 